In the summer of 2002, Leighton Hay, who was 19 at the time and also a black Canadian, was taking high school extension courses. And on Friday, July 5th, he decided to stay home instead of going out that night. The night of July 5th into the morning of July 6th, a crime happened, which Leighton unfortunately became guilty by association. Around one o'clock on July 6th, 2002, Four men and a woman decided to go to the HHMS nightclub in Scarborough, Ontario, where a fundraiser was taking place, hosted by Colin and Roger Moore. Four men wanted to push their way into the club to avoid paying the entrance fee, which led to an altercation. Because of the altercation, the men and the woman were kicked out, but three of those men decided to come back, two of which were armed. Two men that returned armed with guns chased Colin Moore and Roger Moore to the kitchen where the attempted murder of Roger Moore occurred. A bullet grazed his forehead. Colin Moore did not survive the eight gunshot wounds and was murdered in front of some of his family. In the kitchen at the time of the shooting was Colin Moore's wife, Jennifer Moore, and a friend, Lisa Mallard. Neither were injured, luckily. As the shooters were getting away, a witness had noted the green Honda Civic and its license plate. That vehicle belonged to Leighton's mother. How was 19-year-old Leighton Hay associated with this crime? Unfortunately, his older sister Lisa Hay was seeing a man named Gary Yinnock. Gary was easily identified as one of the shooters. The second shooter was described as a tall black man with short dreads and was wearing a blue plaid jacket with a white t-shirt underneath. Because the getaway car was identified as Leighton's mother and Gary's association with Lisa, the Hay residence was under surveillance overnight. The next morning, police went on to retrieve an overwhelming amount of physical evidence connecting Yannick to the crime, notably including a distinctive orange vest found with his blood and gunshot residue on it that witnesses recalled him wearing at the nightclub the night of the shooting. While searching the Hay residence, the police also gathered hair clippings that were discarded and a white t-shirt that belonged to Leighton that had a single speck of gunshot residue. Leighton quickly became a suspect due to his connection to Gary and his mother being the getaway car used that night, as well as the evidence of the hair clippings because the second shooter was described to have short dreads. And when police arrived to the Hay residence, Leighton had his head shaved. So those hair clippings became important as a means of Leighton hiding his identity, less identifiable as the second shooter. Leighton was also considered a suspect due to a prior firearm conviction as well. While Gary's identity was never in doubt, Hay was convicted as his accomplice on the testimony of one witness. Detective Young conducted a lineup of three images of potential suspects to this eyewitness. An image of Leighton from two years ago was included when he used to have dreadlocks. Sole eyewitness during the murder and attempted murder of Roger and Colin Moore was Lisa Mallard. Detective Young showed Mallard the images of potential suspects, which included an old picture of Leighton. She said, out of all these pictures, this gentleman most fits the description of the second shooter. She pointed out Leighton's picture. And on a percentage scale, I would say maybe 80%. Mallard wasn't 100% sure. Detective Young then asked if she was saying, this is the person that did the shooting. He needed a yes or a no. Mallard replied, no. The photograph is about 80% of what depicts the likeliness of the person that did the shooting. A month later, Lisa Mallard was shown a second lineup with a more recent picture of Leighton Hay. She did not pick his picture this time. With all of this evidence against Leighton Hay and Gary Yinnock, they went to trial on May 29, 2004. It was a six week long trial. The jury found both Hay and Yinnock guilty on all charges. Each man was sentenced to life imprisonment with no possibility of parole for 25 years. The prosecution's theory regarding Leighton was that he cut his dreads after the murder of Colin Moore to hide his identity. 
They argued that he had flushed his dreads down the toilet and proceeded to buzz his scalp with the clippers on his nightstand, hence the short hair clippings in the trash. Layton maintained his innocence from the beginning until the end, claiming the hair clippings were facial hair and not scalp hair. Layton's sister and Gary both corroborated his story that he was asleep during these murders. Layton had an appeal in 2009. During this appeal, his sister, Lisa Hay, was cross-examined. She claims that Layton did not have dreadlocks for some time. When attempting to recount Layton's hair length, Lisa was shown an image that shows differently than what she was describing. Lisa Hay's evidence about the length of Layton's hair at the time of the murder is particularly telling, as is her evidence that she did not possess hair clippers to shave his head. Lisa's evidence very much tips the scales in favor of the inference sought by the Crown, that Leighton Hay shaved his head after the murder to disguise his appearance. The judge believed Leighton's trial was fair and denied the appeal. Leighton Hay's conviction seems very cut and dry until you start looking at the details of his case, the evidence, the eyewitness, or the lack thereof. Innocence Canada adopted Leighton Hay's case. The argument about whether the hair clippings were facial or scalp related caught their attention. Hay's counsel requested that the Crown release the hair clippings seized from his residence to the Center of Forensic Sciences, where testing could be performed to distinguish scalp hair from facial hair. Once tested, they found that the clippings had come from Hay's beard, discrediting the Crown's theory that he had shaved his head after the shooting. This proves that Layton could not be the second shooter with the dreads. With the new evidence, it now calls Lisa Maller's eyewitness statement into question. In her statement, she was not 100% sure that Layton was the second shooter, especially when a more recent image is used in the lineup. Considering the crime occurred at a nightclub, the state of sobriety of the witnesses never seemed to be called into question nor clarified either. Having an eyewitness kind of identify a suspect the police decided to narrow in on Leighton, creating the issue of tunnel vision. Regarding Leighton Hay's trial, the eyewitness testimony was very important, but unfortunately, the trial judge had a duty to caution the jurors about eyewitness error, and that was not done during Leighton's trial. The issues in Leighton's case come across as a domino effect. Detective Young may have been suspicious of Leighton prior to the eyewitness testimony, but after he had met with Mallard, it seemed as if he already made up his mind, confining himself to confirmation bias. Regarding Leighton Hay's case, we can begin to dissect whether the problem of his conviction was cognitive or fault-based. Cognitive comes into play when an individual, for example, a police officer, is narrowing in on a suspect, which creates confirmation bias, disregarding the potential of other suspects. In this officer's mind, no one better fits the description than one specific person. There's no canceling out other individuals, and if evidence leads to someone else, it's disregarded. Fault-based would be hiding evidence so that the prosecutors can convict their suspect. Police are constantly feeling pressures from the public and media, especially when it comes to a murder case. In the case of Leighton Hay, it's peculiar whether depicting it is cognitive bias or fault-based because of the domino effect that occurred with Leighton's case. I would argue that the case is a mix of both fault and cognitive based, but there are definite gray areas regarding fault based, and this is because of the issue of Layton's hair clippings. It's what got him convicted. I don't know a lot about forensic science and its history, but forensic hair analysis has been used since 1855, and the difference between facial and scalp hair is the follicle shape and size. The evidence of Layton Hay's hair clippings is what compelled the jury a guilty verdict. Was the lack of testing done because of fault or due to cognitive bias? Why were the hair clippings not tested sooner if the prosecution was so confident in their theory? Regarding cognitive bias and Leighton's case, this revolves heavily around the eyewitness, Lisa Mallard. She told the detective that she was only 80% sure that the image of Leighton, which was an older image, resembled the shooter. Three weeks later, she did not pick Leighton's image again. This should have been a motive for the police to begin searching for other suspects, but that did not happen. This eyewitness error resulted in creating a cognitive bias with law enforcement regarding Leighton's case. After spending 12 long years behind bars, 
while maintaining his innocence. Leighton Hayes' murder and attempted murder charges were dropped after the new evidence regarding the hair clippings came to light. Wrongful convictions are so damaging to the defendant, they too become a victim. Unfortunately, Leighton's mental health has depleted once he was sought as a suspect. He is struggling with mental illness, regrets and resentments. Uh, he's damaged. Uh, he's not the man he was that I'm told he was by his lawyer who did his trial and the man he saw in 2002 when he was arrested. He's deteriorated a lot. Though there may be pressure from public regarding solving a case, law enforcement and the judicial system need to exhaust all other options before pinning someone because in most wrongful convictions, evidence is circumstantial. The objective should be catching the real perpetrator, not finding the easy route out. And the judge said, I apologize for the fact that it has taken this long for the justice system to get it right.